Hello everyone and welcome to Guild Wars 2 Daily. Today we're going to be talking about mechanics and all that good stuff. The footage in the background comes in from Guild Wars 2 Guru and Curse. It's the continuation of the run that the guy did through Kessex Hills. There'll be a link down in the description below. And uh, yeah, let's get straight into it. I kind of don't want to have too much preamble on the start of these videos, so I'm going to try and cut it down. Anyway, so the first thing I wanted to mention was yesterday um, we did a lore episode and I talked about how I thought it'd be cool if some certain characters reappeared in Guild Wars 2. One of them I mentioned was Ogden because he'd undergone the Rite of the Great Dwarf which turned him to stone and uh, I had so many comments on that video of people saying oh no he didn't, he didn't undergo the Rite, he did undergo the Rite. There's a cutscene, I think what's confusing people is there's a cutscene in Eye of the North in which he states he's chosen not to undergo the ritual because dwarves are changing both body and mind and that's added there because obviously after the events of Eye of the North you can still add Ogden to your party and he doesn't turn to stone like that, I guess Arena Net didn't have the time to change the hero once you've completed the story which actually would have been really cool if then you had like a stone version of Ogden after that but anyway so he says in that cutscene no I'm not gonna do it but eventually all dwarves did have to undergo the ritual and and that does include Ogden I'm not sure if the developers specifically stated that but they have said many times in interviews that all dwarves did undergo the ritual and they usually say it with regards to the stone summit the the other faction of dwarves so you had the Deldramor dwarves and the stone summit and the stone summit there was no word of them undergoing the ritual in Eye of the North, but they did. They all did. All the dwarves did. If, if some dwarves, I suppose, had a choice to never undergo it, then it wouldn't really make sense that the, the race is becoming essentially extinct at this point. So, yes, he did undergo it. So, uh, so yeah, if there was any confusion, maybe I should explain that yesterday. But, yes, he did undergo it, even though in a cutscene he says he didn't want to. The first question comes from RaceTlinM122, who says, About the sidekick system, how does it work with regard to traits? If I'm a level 50 travelling in a level 20 zone, I understand that my base stats like HP and so forth will be lowered, but what will happen to my traits? Now, this is a funny question because I first recorded this video and it was my impression that you got to keep the traits and that this was quite an awesome thing because it would allow you to keep sort of customizations of your character and extra little perks even when you were in a scaled down area, which was quite nice. So your core stats would be lowered, except you'd be able to keep these things. However, after I finished filming the episode, I, I went off and looked online just to be 100% sure that you did keep your traits. And all I could find was the fact that ArenaNet said when your side kicked down it affects your attributes as well as your core stats so then logic would follow that because your attributes have been lowered that would mean you could potentially then lose your perks so then I re-recorded the video and said oh no you do lose your traits but apparently now it turns out you do even though those attributes are lowered you do still actually manage to keep those little perks so this is really cool and it means that a lot of what I was originally talking about is actually still relevant about the interesting way that Arena Net seemed to have set up the system so that it feels satisfying to players who have been scaled down to a lower power and yet still feel like they've earned something from levelling up. There are certain things that you will earn as you play through the game that allow you to become stronger and make the gameplay more interesting. Part of becoming stronger is obviously having your base stats increased. And when you sidekick back down, Arena Net will take these stats, these things that are core to how powerful essentially your character is, they will take these stats and modify them to a point where they are appropriate for the level area you're in, right? Which is which is very cool. And that we all understand why this is kind of a good system. But there is always a fear with this system that players will feel like it was pointless ever leveling up when they can't go back and slaughter things that they used to have trouble with. So where does the game retain that sense of progression when you've gone back to a previous area? Well they do this by giving you some things that won't go away. The best example really is skills, so if you get to level 30 and then you unlock your elite slot, that's when you've unlocked your final skill. When you go back into a level 5 zone, that does it's not going to reduce all of the skills that you've got available to you right now and lock off loads of your utility skills. No, that won't it won't do that. So a big sense of the progression will be that you will be able to go back to these earlier areas and use an elite skill. You'll be able to, if you're an elementalist, turn into a tornado, which is something that people who haven't been scaled down and are just naturally at that point in that character's lifespan won't be able to do. So you will still get this sense that you've progressed and you'll get extra things. And traits are another one of these. Skills are probably the best example. And traits seem a little bit weird as well. I mean, I, this certainly seems like something that ArenaNet might end up removing, really. But they 
it doesn't certainly seem like they have any plans for that. I just think it's something that could happen if if scaling got a bit out of control and players were still too powerful. But all those traits, those things that make your character kind of unique, all those little perks that you've chosen to give yourself, which you've only managed to acquire through leveling up a serious amount and putting enough attributes into things, yeah, those you get to keep. So there are certain things in the game that will remain with you. That it certainly seems like sidekicking at the moment is just about stats and not just your core stats, but also the stats that obviously your equipment gives you. You know, there's going to be stuff on your weapon. Your weapon might do just a, a number out of nowhere, 355 to 400 damage, right? That might be your sword. But you go down to, into an earlier level and it's not going to be doing that much damage anymore. However, equipment can also have extra perks on it, like Magic Find. It's this certain thing that you can upgrade weapons with, and when you've got Magic Find, it increases your chance to find drops that have got other magical powers on them. So it kind of increases your ability to find good loot, basically. And th this is something that can be on your character. Now, does this mean when we're scaled down, we'll lose those as well? No, no, you don't lose those, as far as I can see. And there's going to be combat versions of those too. So there will be these things you're gaining as you go through the game that you get to keep even when you've been scaled down and to a point that will mean this is why I suppose in their interviews they explain that a level 80 character scaled down to a level 5 zone is still going to be in some ways better than a level 50 character and that's because that level 80 character might have better equipment things like this so I mean skills obviously plateaus quite early at level 30 so that kind of goes out of the picture quite quickly but this is kind of the philosophy they've got going there uh, you get more flavor I suppose you could say unlocking and a, a degree of power too as you get to the higher levels but you will always be scaled back down to a reasonable point. I think they've worked that out quite well, and uh, there's obviously room for balance to screw this whole system up, and there's room for things to go wrong. But uh, I think their general idea with how they're implementing it right now is, is spot on, and I think there's nothing in there at the moment that will just screw the whole system over, as far as I can see it, you know, numbers and balancing tweaks aside. The next question was asked by Jack Jack Danny, who said, how many slots will have, by the way, this is a quick question, how many slots will we have for our characters? As I know, some people would very much like to play every race and every profession. With that said, those people with more than one characters, will others be able to identify them as the same user, or will they play anonymously? I ask this because I personally came across people with different characters pretending to be someone else later to find out they were one and the same. Right, well, well, let's do your first question, then I guess this is kind of two quick questions. First question, it, it seems like they've settled on five. They have not officially announced that. They, this is something that they've always said is under development and they're not sure about. I think most of the community's always expected them to stick with five, really. Five is a good amount. It lets you have one of each race. And players will, as you say, want to play one of each profession. And there will be a fair amount of those. Not every player is going to want that. And, you know, a lot of players will get bored after their fourth character through. The fact is, though, with five different races if you were to use up all those slots with a different race each time you're going to experience very different personal stories each time so it should stay fresh and once you play through the game even all the way up to level 80 let's say on five different characters there's going to be less players that then are going to say right well all right now i want to go do this again but on a different profession there are obviously a lot of branches to your personal story so i can see a lot of reason why players will want to create lots of alt characters but that's that, that does leave you three short for having all of the professions as well as all of the races and they're probably doing that simply so that they can earn some more money out of the cash shop people who really want that who have already got all these hours out of the game on their first five characters and it can potentially you know participate in end game stuff too it's not like they've ran out of content but they just want to create another character then those guys will have to buy a character slot for I think it was like five pounds or three pounds, like five dollars for Guild Wars One. I reckon it'll probably be about the same price. Again, nothing's confirmed though. This is all just what we've speculated on, and I, I reckon that's probably what they'll end up doing. They'll be selling extra character slots for people who desperately want a level eighty of every single profession. And there will be people out there. I, I totally understand that. Some people want eight slots, but I, th I, you know, if I was arena in it, I've got to be honest. If I was them, I would also put it at five. Five is I, I think pretty much the magic number. Some people are even thinking four, so that players could have four of the races but if they really wanted to play the final race, they'd have to buy something. I think that's a bit over the top, though. If we do see Guild Wars 2 do that, then I, I won't be very happy about it. But uh, 5 is what I'm expecting, and I believe 5 is what's been in the betas at the moment. So I, w I would stick with that at the moment, until obviously we hear otherwise. 
Uh, as for your other question about when you've got multiple characters, can you tell who the actual player is? I, I think the way it worked in Guild Wars 1 will probably come forward with Guild Wars 2, and that's that if you don't have them added as a friend, you won't know. I think the idea might be that when you add someone as a friend in Guild Wars 2, you'll like get like uh, an overall name of theirs. Like For example, in Guild Wars 1, if you add a specific character name, and then that player logs on as a different character, in your friends list, you'll see the character that they're currently playing, and and the name of the character that you once knew them as. Uh, ArenaNet might go with something else though, in other MMOs you see stuff like people have account names and then once you've added them as a friend you just see their account name rather than their character name all the time and the, the game just works out what character they're currently playing as. That could happen too. Uh, about being able to tell who, play, who the player is behind the character even when they're not on your friend list, I'm not so sure that they'll go with that. That seems like on some levels it could be a bit of an invasion of privacy but hey, I mean it might be something that they go for. It's not something I'm really going to be looking for is it's more something that once you've added someone then you'll be able to find that kind of stuff out and that's kind of what I'd expect them to be going with uh, in the second game. The last question was asked by Dr. Wisey, who said, Are there going to be any loading screens in Guild Wars 2 when you travel from one area to another? Because this was one of the most annoying things in any MMO. It takes the persistence of the world away. What do you think about it? Ah, loading screens, yeah, people people did not like this, they didn't like it. They heard that Guild Wars 2, ages ago, right, it had been announced, Guild Wars 2 is not going to be an instance game, this is going to be a fully persistent world, like you see other MMOs. And at that point, with the Guild Wars 1 community, they were like, half the people started bitching that they were going to go and become a more traditional MMO, and you know, a good three quarters of those people that were bitching pretty quickly came back and started to get excited about the game anyway. And the other half of the people thought this was, was brilliant, because it meant no more loading screens. Guild Wars 1 is plagued with loading screens. They're all over the place. Where the game is instant, whenever you go out from a place where you can meet other people to a place where you're going to be participating in normal content with your party members, there's a loading screen. There's loading screens all over the places, through instances, everything. Uh, Guild Wars 1 was alright with its loading screens though, because once you downloaded all the files, it was just as simply as connecting and the bar would shoot up instantly. It would take like two seconds to load you in. On my computers, that's how it always was anyway. I knew some people that would have longer loading screens and I I can only imagine how annoying that game was for them, but it plagued the first game. Guild Wars 2 still has loading screens, and those half people who thought that Guild Wars 2 becoming a persistent world meant there weren't going to be any loading screens, got really upset when all of a sudden they figured out, oh my god, the, the game's still going to have loading screens, what's going on? There's a difference between having a persistent world and a fully open world, and people usually think that the two go hand in hand. Games like World of Warcraft are fully persistent open worlds, right? In the they're persistent in that you can run around anywhere you like and there's no segmenting off of players, if you will. There will be to some degree, obviously, because you can have different servers, different worlds, overflow shards, things like that. So people will be segmented off. That's just natural. That has to happen for an MMO. But there's a big difference between having a fully persistent game, as Guild Wars 1 was known as, and something like World of Warcraft or Rift or any other MMO, pretty much, where wherever you walk around the world, there's a chance that you'll find someone else walking around there unless you're in a specific instant zone like a dungeon or a raid right so but that is different having a persistent world that's what it means to be a persistent world that's different to having a fully open world which simply means you can if you see a mountain you can walk over to that mountain there's not, not going to be anything stopping you there's going to be no invisible barriers necessarily you can just keep walking and walking and that goes hand in hand with having no loading screens so a lot of MMOs have both they are open worlds and they are fully persistent worlds Guild Wars 2 is a fully persistent world but it's not a hundred percent open it's still got so it's still segmented off into huge chunks of land that are essentially like the explorable areas of guild wars one except they're like five of these things damn stitched together and that puts a lot of people off with the game i think when they start looking at footage though they realise they've got the wrong impression of what's happening here. The explorable areas in Guild Wars 2 are massive. They're absolutely huge. The world might as well feel like an open world because they're huge. But you will be funnelled into small portals between cliff faces that push you through a loading screen before you can go into the next huge area of the world. And there's like 25 of these large areas that encompass the whole game. So that should give you a rough idea of how often you're going to be going through loading screens. So there are loading screens in the game. And a lot of people got very, very upset about it. But do you understand that just because they're loading screens, that, that has nothing to do with the whole MMO part. Um, ArenaNet have been asked about this in interviews, and I remember one thing they once said, which I suppose convinced me enough. They said, look, 
We've made these things as big as we possibly can with our infrastructure. These these areas are going to be huge and you're not going to be seeing many loading screens. We've definitely created the game in such a way that you're not supposed to see many loading screens. For example, if you go in a personal story step, it's not going to tell you to speak to one NPC one side of a loading screen, then another NPC the other side of the loading screen, and then go back to the original NPC. So you get like three loading screens in just a couple of minutes. That would suck. They say they've tried to design the game so that that kind of thing doesn't happen very often, which is cool, but you have to consider that a lot of the time these personal story parts will take you into their own little instances anyway and you're going to be having loading screens there and another thing that does sort of contradict what they're saying here is their system about waypoints their fast travel system which you don't see in many MMOs a lot of MMOs take a much more traditional thing and force you to walk or ride your mount or whatever a lot of people applaud the waypoint system and so do I I think it's great but you do have to consider that every time you waypoint you're also going to be going to a loading screen so is the game going to be encouraging us to use a lot of waypoints all the time well I, I guess we'll find out when we get in there loading screens are a part of Guild Wars 2 though and I, I agree with you they're not very immersive and they're not amazing but if the game's anything like Guild Wars 1 and it has been built essentially on the same engine it's just been updated and all the infrastructure and stuff that goes on in the back end is still there so if the game is anything like Guild Wars 1 you'll probably find that once you've been all around the world and downloaded like the entire files of the world and um, these loading screens should be really short and quite unintrusive I found them to be very unintrusive in Guild Wars 1 despite the fact they were far more prominent there than I'm expecting them to be in Guild Wars 2. But they are there, you can't butter it up, there will be loading screens, they're just probably not going to be as significant a deal as you might originally be expecting. You've seen how big the world is, and you really shouldn't underestimate the size of these explorable areas and how rare it is. Just from moving from one area to the other, you're actually going to be coming across them. But I do have my eye on how waypoints will interact with that because uh, I might end up feeling like that's too many loading screens and that would suck, to be quite honest, it would suck. But there you go guys, that was Guild Wars 2 Daily for today. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks again to Guild Wars 2 Guru and Curse for the footage that was in the background. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. And I will see you tomorrow. Ah, oh, there's so much guff that I say at the start and the end of these episodes. Oh well.